Welcome to the IISS. It's um, actually 20 years ago this month that the state of Bosnia and Herzegovina was born in circumstances of trauma that are, uh, were almost literally unimaginable at the time and are very hard to grasp uh, both morally and intellectually to this day. After three and a half years of war, the state was endowed with its complicated structure at the Dayton Peace Conference of late 1995. Both the trauma of the war and the structure of the state have remained complications as Bosnia, together with other former Yugoslav republics, seeks membership, uh, seeks to draw closer and eventual membership in Euro-Atlantic institutions, including the European Union. We are very, very pleased to welcome the Foreign Minister of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Dr. Zlatko Lagumja, to the IISS. Dr. Lagumja began his second term as Foreign Minister last month, having previously held the role uh, in the, uh, between 2001 and 2003. He's President of the Social Democratic Party of Bosnia and Herzegovina and has been a member of international missions to Pakistan and post-Saddam Iraq. Foreign Minister, thank you very much for coming to speak to us. The floor is yours. First of all, I want to thank you for invitation to speak in such a distinguished institution. Uh, of course, uh, it's my honor and privilege to be here today and here as I was introduced uh, as someone who was twice uh, Foreign Minister. Uh, yesterday, I started my official visit here in, in London with an extremely well, valuable uh, meeting with the State Sec Foreign Secretary, William Haig, who I met for the third time uh, in my life or in recent years. Uh, first time we met some years ago when both of us were more in shadow than on the sunlight. Uh, it was when he was visiting uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, he told me next time when we meet, he's going to get out of the shadow. He fulfilled his promise. He did. He won elections together with his party colleagues and coalition partners. And second time when I saw him, uh, uh, I was still in shadow. So we agreed that next time when we meet, it will be that we are some kind of uh, in the same position. Of course, we could be in the same position that he went back to shadow, but unfortunately, I mean, for some people, uh, both of us were yesterday meeting in very sunny London. Uh, so we have seen third time, lucky time. Uh, I hope that uh, there's more lucky times in front of me, because I was in my lifetime twice foreign minister, I was twice prime minister, and twice Deputy Prime Minister. So after the next elections, I'm looking for something which will be, in 2014, the country that will be flourishing, the country will be in NATO, that when we are memorating 100 years of the wars being starting in Europe, that we will say that 2014, gathering in Sarajevo, we will be able to say that one century of the wars in Europe, in Europe is over. And in order to do so, I think my country and region has to do a lot in next little bit more than two years that are in front of us. So by speaking about the previous 20 years, I'll talk about next two years for the beginning. Why next two years? Because I think that 2012 is the key year for the region to do something and to be really substantial part of broader Euro-Atlantic uh, associations and integrated uh, as much as it is possible, so 2014 should be a different year. Now go back 20 years ago. Uh, of course, I had the honor and privilege to talk with uh, Brigadier Benjamin Berry, who was actually uh, a few times in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I hope he won't, uh, it's not, it wasn't scripted, what I'm saying now, uh, because we just met uh, briefly before I was getting in, and I was really, honored and privileged with some of the people I met, and especially when Brigadier Berry told me about his experience in Bosnia and Herzegovina back in 95 and 96, and then back again in 2003, which shows that actually the war that started 20 years ago 
which ended with the and Peace Accord, was very successful war-ending mission. Uh, it was even peace building mission in the beginning, it was also well functioning. Uh, there is no evidence, as far as we could recall, that there was such a efficient and effective military mission under UN umbrella or NATO umbrella because after a war in which today we have verdicts in Hague for such a war crimes which include genocide as well, that after such a war we had an international peace building mission which not only stopped the war but when they transformed as UN and NATO mission, they turned it over to European forces which in the meantime got established and the record says that there is no one single soldier that was even wounded, not saying killed, in any kind of combat activities since peace was signed. Some people are saying that even uh, because it started with dozens of thousands of soldiers from all over the world. Uh, and uh, evidence says that even soldiers who moved from their bases, NATO bases from all over the Europe, who moved in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, there is an evidence, I heard once, uh, there is an evidence that even there were less casualties per soldier in traffic accidents, because we have such a rotten roads that they were driving so carefully. <laughs> and uh, they didn't even get many wounds like driving in Italy, around Nepal bases, in Germany, in which, of course, it's not my call for having rotten roads in the future, because it's just uh, to say how that part of the mission was good. But where do we live today? We live today in a country which uh, is called the one, two, three, four, five country. One country, one state, two entities, three ethnic major religion or groups, as well as fourth religion, as well as fourth group of people who consider them, themselves not only Bosnian Serbs and Croats, but they consider them Bosnians, others, however. And five stands, some people say that four, four stands for four million people, four million citizens who are sharing the same roof, who are coming, from, who are living in two entities, who are members of three major ethnic groups but there are four million individuals. And there is five. Five is, uh, some people say that there's uh, five levels of a government we have. I live about 100 meters from where I was born. Uh, in diameter of a few hundred meters, I have president of my municipality. Uh, then about 300 meters from my home, I have a president of my city. He's even called the president of the city. Uh, then, about, I don't know, a few hundred meters from my home because I live in the central part of Bosnia and Sarajevo. There is president of my canton. Then the president of the canton uh, doesn't share the building with anyone, but across the street he has a president of federation. And of course the president of federation shares the building with the president of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So in uh, actually three different buildings, I have five presidents in between me as a citizen and my president. Of course, it's a very complicated system, and that's what we have as, as inheritance of the data. But how we can overcome that? How we can overcome that difficulty and what we can do in time in front of us to make these two years in front of us different so that 2014 we can expect in better setting? Uh, first of all, I want to say that we uh, a long time after elections, we formed in the end government on central level. Where that's where my top president is. Those previous presidents and governments were okay; they were there uh, right after elections. But the fifth state government was established about uh, actually three, four months ago. We made the political deal, which resulted with the government in which I'm serving as deputy prime minister and foreign minister. Uh, the reason why we waited for long, such a long time is because since Dayton Peace Accord 
until the last elections. We had actually the governments that were always formed on the basis of who is key Serb, who is key Bosnia, who is key Croat. So we had actually the governments always formed around exclusive representation of Bosniaks, exclusive representation of Serbs, and exclusive representation of Croats. Um, a few years ago, I was um, at that time as a leader of opposition, uh, warmly hugged, supported, and blessed by a lot of representatives of so-called international community in Bosnia and Herzegovina who are telling me, Mr. Lagunja, I mean, you lead a multi-ethnic party. Members of the parliament are coming from your party. Are the only members of the parliament since Dayton Peace Accord who are not coming from only one ethnic group? It's a pity that you have only 120,000 votes. And you're a number four, fifth party in the country. But if your party would grow a little bit stronger, if you would get additional 50,000 votes, if that multi-ethnic glue, political glue, would be stronger, then we would have some kind of a political setting in which we would talk about putting together ethnic representation and civic representation together. Civil society and society which respects differences of ethnicities and their rights in constitutional sense. Uh, a few years later, there were elections, and I made a mistake. I didn't win 50,000 more votes. I won 150,000 more votes. And we jumped instead of being number four or five party, we happened to be number one party. And we broke the party. We broke the nirvana, in which three ethnic leaders were always there. Now there was someone who says, wait a second. Of course, we who are sharing same political opinion in one party, we are people who are Bosniak, Serbs, and Croats, and others, individually. And we are that no less than anyone who is coming from his or her ethnic party. But we want to be also treated as someone who is more than world. Has individual profile, civil society profile. We are not neglecting that Bosnia and Herzegovina has three constituent historically defined ethnic groups, Serbs, Croats, and Bosniaks. We are that as well. And we want to preserve that. But we want to see also that there is legitimacy to have civil society in place as well. And then someone who is coming from non-mono-ethnic party can also be seated someplace and represent himself, herself, and political affiliation that he or she is, and to be also valid as a good representative of ethnicity <coughs> as well. So this is the reason why it took so long. On the end, we made agreement. And uh, I'm uh, the leader and representative of the only party whose members in governments on all levels are coming from all ethnic groups, not only from major ethnic group uh, in mathematical sense. When I say major, there is no major ethnic group in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There is only mathematical differences. But Serbs, Croats, and Bosniaks all have supposed and should have equal rights constitutionally and otherwise. Uh, now, what do we have in front of us? Uh, right now, the, the, our major goal, major goals of this government can be set up in, in three, I would say, goals or tools. And I treat those goals as the tools, tools for the substantial goal of every government. First tool or goal in Bosnia and Herzegovina of the new government is to speed up the uh, process of getting closer to NATO membership. That's the reason why one of the first things that we agreed upon was so-called uh, sorting out military property, which was our precondition for next uh, NATO summit in Chicago to get upgraded from cargo to economy, uh, uh, to get so-called MAP status, which is far away from NATO or from business class. But it's still, we would be moved from being cargo. Uh, and we did it. And we hope that that goal uh, will be fulfilled. First station in Chicago will be reached, and in Chicago, uh, we will, as I said yesterday, to a few occasions, we will be more musical Chicago than, than, than something else. 
in May this year and continue that process, hoping, hoping that by 2014 we can uh, be a host of something which will be in summer 2014 in which there is possibility that a few hundred meters from the place where Archduke was assassinated back in 1914 when the officially, technically, historically in our history books war started that a few hundred meters from that place in headquarters of military defense we can pull up the flag which saying that NATO lives there and uh, the new century is actually starting. Now when I said new century, I think that the new century for us should be starting sometimes after 2014 when we close the map of the region and include the region militarily and economically and politically in broader structures, which is leading me to the second goal, which is European Union, or second tool. NATO and EU we see as a tools, as a tools for our goal, and our real goal is economic and social cohesion of the country, in which there will be less than five presidents in between me as a citizen and I'm lucky, by the way, all five of them are coming from my party in my constituency, so, so my life is relatively easy, but I mean, I'm very, I'm not so, that's not so common situation. Uh, so the EU is something that we see as a tool for internal transformation of the country. We think that uh, EU, our candidacy status, especially after Croatia, is going to have next year, hopefully, commissioner in EU as a full-size, full-scale member of EU. After Serbia got their candidacy status, which for both things we think are great for Bosnia and Herzegovina, because it's great that they are in front of us, and it's great because it will challenge us more to catch them up. Uh, we should not uh, cry for the fact that we are so far behind. We should do more in order to be close to them. And the things are possible. The things that change, that change, changes are possible. Why the changes are possible? Because of a very simple reason. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, when Bosnia and Herzegovina got granted Council of Europe membership, uh, the biggest promoter of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, membership in Council of Europe was my late friend Zoran Djinjic, former Prime Minister of Serbia, who at that time was together with Foreign Minister Svilanovic advocating that Bosnia and Herzegovina gets Council of Europe stat status, even Serbia was not having it, because they thought that our Europe, Council of Europe status will make them be faster in getting there quicker than it would without us. Now the thing's twisted. They're a few years ahead of us, and now we are their promoter, hoping that they will catch them and go faster to the, our real goal, which is EU. And of course, when I was talking about 20 years ago, I would come back on this introduction to 20 years ago and something that is in front of us. Uh, 20 years ago, on April 6th, uh, they say, according to some, that's one of the landmark date in our history. That's actually not the date where war started. War started earlier. But April 6th is the day when uh, European Union and the United States recognized Bosnia and Herzegovina as an independent state. And April 6th is the day when uh, the siege of Sarajevo started. April 6th is the day uh, in which uh, Karadzic and Madic forces surrounded the city and started shooting in the city. Uh, that was the day in, uh, for, in which the besiege, last besiege in Europe, last besieged city in Europe in 20th century, uh, started and uh, three and a half years later ended with death toll of 11,541 killed citizens, out of which 643 were children. Uh, Susan Zontag, who was coming in besieged city as one of the leading world intellectuals, writer, uh, she wrote down 
that the first 20th century started in Sarajevo in 1914. And 20th century is ending in Sarajevo with the besiege of the Sarajevo. So I think that 2014, 2014 is the year in which we have to show that 21st century is different. We have still time. We didn't show it yet that 21st century is different. But by 2014, we can show that 21st century is different, at least in Europe. And there's a reason why this government is committed, regardless of all our differences, political disputes and everything, to go faster. Faster on NATO path, EU path, and faster on putting together more glue among us in social and economic sense. Uh, this morning, I had very interesting meeting with a very important person and important institution for us, which is EBRD, with the president of uh, European Bank for Development. Uh, I started a meeting with president of EBRD by, by telling him how I was comforting myself after the Hidden Peace Accord was signed. I was comforting myself after the Dayton Peace Accord was signed because I caught myself a few times saying, this peace is no good because it brought us nothing but the peace. And then I realized that something is wrong with my thoughts. Is, isn't that something to have a peace? And then I realized that, well, peace without justice is really not the peace. But in order to get the justice, first we should start with peace. So let's give peace a chance to give a chance to justice. And then I, since I'm, uh, you know, by, by, by political affiliation, there are some people and some persons who I admire very strong historically, then I took for my personal comfort the words of uh, historical leader of a socialist international, Willy Brandt, former German chancellor and SPD leader, who once upon a time said that peace is not everything, but without peace nothing is possible. So today I remembered that saying by heading here after, on the ending of, end of the meeting with President of EBRD, but telling him, well, economy is not everything, but without economy nothing is possible. So now we are in the next stage. We have to do something with economy. And in that respect, I can assure you that we have serious plans which will show that in the next two years, the economy of Bosnia and Herzegovina is going in the right direction. And closing up this introduction, uh, yesterday I was visiting an uh, editorial group of Financial Times. Uh, they had excellent, marvelous masterpiece, uh, which was made for this weekend. Financial Times magazine uh, done by Alan Russell, who was uh, as a 24 years old journalist in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And he made excellent work uh, talking about unforgiven, unforgotten, and unresolved country and people over there. And it was good that 20 years after he's reminding us of that. But I asked him, do me a favor, let's see where we are in a year from now. Can we have that, not we can cover page, but at least can we be covered in a year from now to show that there is economy moving in Bosnia, that the things are uh, moving in the right direction, hoping that we will not be ever, ever again so CNN-able like we used to be. Because in the end, if you become so CNN-able as a small country, either you found uh, ultimate cheap uh, medicine against all cancers and all illnesses, or you're in a deep misery. So I hope we'll never be CNN-able. I hope we will start being little normal news. Maybe not on the front page, but just be there as uh, someone who is moving forward. And I really do think that it is possible. Of course, we should 
run for justice and keep looking for justice because there were so many things and crimes that were unpunished. It has to be brought in the end. We have to hit the very core of injustice, which is poverty in a country. That's why economy counts. And of course, we should finally be resolved in order to get on the second page of FT. We should always be unforgotten because we should never forget what happened. Never forget. But we should be able to forgive. And the only way to forgive is to be a country in which justice exists and lives, in which poverty is becoming less an issue. And I'm basically speaking optimist that in this year we will start a new beginning, have our next landmark 2014. Uh, in April 6, I'm sure that you will see Sarajevo again, because my dear friend Haris Pašović, theater director, is making one performance in the very city of Sarajevo at 2 o'clock, Sarajevo time, uh, with the artists from the region. They're making 60 minutes, just like this lecture was intended to be, and with questions and answers. They're making 60 minutes show in which artists from the region will be do concert, which will end with uh, 700 kids, with Slovenian director, conductor, with, uh, with excellent artist, uh, from Belgrade, with some people from the region, from Montenegro, from Croatia, and kids from Sarajevo. Uh, and the performance will go from internal flame, famous center of city of Sarajevo, to the presidency building, uh, with 11,541 uh, red chair. Uh, the concert will be for the empty chairs. I'm absolutely sure that uh, that itself should not put us back where we were, but should give us uh, strength and uh, energy uh, to have a future which is different and which shows that we learned from the past. Well, that's about where I will stop for the moment. Thank you. Minister, thank you. Thank you very much for those eloquent remarks. Um, I'm going to um, open, open it up to the floor in just a moment, but I think I'll uh, ask you the first question, which uh, I think goes to um, is, is are possibly an unanswerable one for someone from your position, but it does go, I think, to the heart of, or at least some of what you were talking about. And it is basically to ask you, uh, you know, do you believe that the coherence of, of the state of Bosnia and Herzegovina can be, can be move forward in, you know, on the economic, political, historic, historical, and even artistic realms that you were talking about? Um, or is there a fundamental constitutional problem that um, at one day or another is going to have to be solved? I think, oh, is it working? Yes, it's, uh, it's, yeah. up, it's on. It's on, okay. Well, uh, you hit the very core of the problem, which I purposely didn't want to do introductory remarks because uh, if I would focus myself on a very core problem, which is our constitution, then it would look like I'm excusing ourselves for not functioning and not producing anything. Uh, we have constitution which was made for segregated society. Uh, constitution as we spoke, I mean, uh, peace accord was uh, efficient and functioning because Everyone in Bosnia and Herzegovina, everyone in the region was fed up with the war, and there were global consensus that the war has to be stopped, and there was absolute consensus among all the key players, locally, regionally, and globally, that war has to stop. 
the best way to stop the war was to please people who were actually having control over the guns. And the best way to do it was to make a constitutional construct that will actually please the preservation of that political status quo. That's the reason why our constitution is actually a constitution that was made up for segregated society. And segregated society in 21st century in Europe, I don't think it's possible to stand for long. It can be, maybe for a while, composed, imposed, institutionalized, but it has to break up sooner or later. Uh, our constitution is designed uh, in a sense that we have politically to affiliate ourselves to our ethnic, ethnic background if we want to have successful elections. So if you have that type of construct, then the best way to do run elections is to create a fear and to try to, quote, under quote, protect your ethnic group. And that itself is not leading to productive, productive a governance, system of governance. Well, now, what happened in Dayton? Uh, of course, creators of Dayton knew what they were you know, offering us as a, as, a, as a constitution. But there's a reason why they established institution, so-called Office of the High Representative. It's interesting, the office is one man. Uh, so that office was actually invented in order to, uh, in order to resolve the political gridlocks because of constitutional deficiencies. Now, if we take that in account, it means that the, the, the system was, well, we were the most productive during Petty Ash downtime because, I mean, he was pushing, 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 and the laws were passing, 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 but it was not the laws because, because we were legislatively so well, but it was because we had high rep who was actually doing our homework a lot. Uh, there was at that time, a, favorite sentence uh, among key political players on, on especially on executive and legislative positions. It was called a uh, game called uh, Mr. High Rep send me a letter. So High Rep sends you a letter saying you have to do this and this otherwise you will see. And then he or she says and goes to his party leader, a colleague says well we have to do it because otherwise he will do something. And then legislative passed through. So there was not genuine internal dynamic in a country. Uh, what I'm saying, that the Constitution is definitely functioning as much as high rep is efficient and effective. Now, is it possible to have efficient and effective system uh, in, under these conditions without high rep? Well, the ultimate answer is no. But can we do better if we create some kind of political will that we have to do something together? If we, if we try to change our culture. Yes, we have to do it. And then, I'm absolutely sure that we will change our constitutional framework properly. How we can change our constitutional framework properly? There are, theoretically speaking, three ways to do it. One way is we just do it because we are smart and we like each other and we trust each other and we are so responsible. That's not the case in today's post and Govina. So uh, we cannot do it just like that. Second thing is, we get to Dayton too. Someone puts us in another Air Force base and, and don't let us get out before we change something. There's, there's no will among us, but who cares about us? There's no will among key international players to do Dayton too, let's face it. And option number three is someone sits in a tank and make besiege of something. That is not gonna happen and not because after all, there are not so many tanks around uh, there are not so many uh, energy of that type. People are not interested to starting the war because of constitution. The war may start if someone tries to do something unconstitutionally and tries to violate peace accord and tries to re take away part of the country. But I don't think that anyone today is really serious when he or she is talking about taking part of the country out of the country. Because if that would happen, then we would have probably something which you can call war, you can call however you want to, but that is something that we not going to happen. So what we will, what was the solution? The solution is probably that's the reason why we are taking those tools called NATO and EU to transform internally and to upgrade our constitutional framework in that capacity and creating some kind of political will of cooperation among, among us. Uh, 
when, what speed it will take, that's, that's another question. But I personally think that uh, the fight against corruption, fight against poverty, fight against unemployment is going to result with much better political atmosphere in which we will be able to do those internal transformations, including constitutional changes properly in time in front of us. Thank you. Gabriel Partos. Gabriel Partos from the, sorry, yeah, from the Economist Intelligence Unit. Uh, Mr. Lagumji, I'd like to ask you, when do you plan to submit an application to the EU to, to join? And indeed, when would you expect to get candidate status? And linked to that, of course, you mentioned the Office of the High Representative, but presumably any closer integration with Europe will depend on Bosnia and Herzegovina becoming a fully sovereign state. So when would you see the country becoming ready to see the closure of the, of the office? Well, uh, we, were, we were told uh, by the end of the last year that in order to have credible application, we should sort out two things when we speak about EU. Uh, I'm talking about credible application, not about candidacy. Uh, it was so-called census law on census, and a law on so-called state aid. Uh, those two laws were stuck in a parliament with our previous government for about two years, and we didn't form a government. We were not in agreement about those things. Then, actually, when we made political agreement on December 28th about formation of the new government, we sorted out the issue of budget for last year, which was country was without budget for two years. We sorted the issue of budget. We sorted the issue of law of census and law on state aid law. Uh, of course, when we did it, someone told us that we should, in order to have credible application, we should source our, our so-called Sadich Finci case, which is one of piece of our constitutional deficiencies. Now, my question is why, I mean, after we fixed those two things that were pending for years in a, in a pile, why, when we did it, someone is giving us something which I understand we have to do. But why to connect that with candidacy status? Okay, I'm not the one who is deciding about the candidacy status, but I can at least complain why suddenly a uh, new condition, because it's not helping to no one. It's not going to make me uh, do that homework faster. It may, as a matter of fact, uh, create a backlash. Now, uh, what do I expect? I expect we'll do everything in our power to, 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 to do uh, credible application by the end of this semester. Not at the university, but at the EU. Uh, because we will do everything in our power to do it by the end of June. And we hope that we will be able to, in order to do so, in the next 15, 20 days, we have to sort out the issue of budget for this year, because budget for this year is something which would be necessary for having financing institutions that we substantially need for fulfilling EU things. So that's the reason why the budget, after two years of having no budget, would be a greater step as far as I'm concerned than, than, than those things. Uh, uh, having in mind, and then when the candidacy status, of course the candidacy status de depends of strongly of, our, our, of the credibility of our application, and uh, I think that we can in reasonable time catch up Serbia, maybe 2014 is an excellent year to put a lot of, a lot of firework uh, together. and. Uh, showing that Bosnia-Herzegovina is in NATO, but, and it is also in a reversible path to something which is called EU. Now, the last question is about OHR, which is, uh, I want to clarify this. My, you, you, I mean, the question that you're putting is very often question. And, uh, you know, I can't say I can't agree with question, but I mean, I have to say something about it. Uh, I argue with the people who are saying that without, uh, with OHR, we cannot have candidacy status. The question is why? The question is why? We have two roles of OHR which were uh, put together uh, until recently. Uh, OHR and EUSR. Uh, very wisely, those two things were uh, divided, and we have really an excellent uh, EUSR, Peter Sorensen, who is doing a good job in Sarajevo, and he's EUSR, and that's one job. Mr. Insko is high rep. What is high rep? High rep is guarantor of peace accord. High rep is guarantor not of Europe, 
out of peace accord and guarantee that in case of constitution, constitutional deficiencies before we get rid of them, he will be there to sort out the problems so they don't jeopardize the peace. Uh, all comparisons are always double-edged sword. But what is the problem that uh, we have high rep as the guarantor of peace accord, according to the Security Council decisions from 95, uh, in which high rep can call for certain actions if the peace is jeopardized, if anyone does something against constitutional constitution of the country and peace accord. What if someone to call, tomorrow calls a referendum on one part of the country? Don't think that it is so clear which part of the country. On one part of the country. What if someone calls a referendum of the part of the country and part of a of neighboring country to form a new country? What if things like that start happening? What if we start talking about such a things? And some people start getting strange ideas that that is possible. Now, if someone does something like that, high rep, as a guarantor of peace accord, have to be able to, to stop violation of peace accord. Uh, in 1990, uh, when Austria became member, full member of EU, before that day, one day before they became member of EU, they had to convene in the parliament to change some constitutional things. Uh, Peace Implementation Council of World War II, uh, symbolizing four powers, also had a meeting in which they actually uh, changed the status of Austria as being under some kind of office of the high representative of that, that Peace Implementation Council of winners in World War II. So, I mean, what was the problem that Austria do, Austria do all their homework, everything under being protectorate to a certain extent, technically, formally, legally speaking, under four great powers. So what is the problem that today uh, Security Council makes decision that OHR is not no more needed because the peace is not more jeopardized and tomorrow Bosnia and Herzegovina is member of EU? I'm talking about hypothetical today. I'm talking about one day today in which high rep will be connected with us being a normal country with historical parallel, which I just made. From the IISS, Nick Redman. Uh, Minister, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk uh, about the Turkish role uh, within, within the Balkans. Um, obviously a historical power, but in the last couple of years we've visibly seen an increase in, uh, in Turkish self-confidence, but at the same time over the last year, Turkish attention has uh, inevitably been focused much more on southern Mediterranean than northern Mediterranean. So in terms of the balance sheet, how does it, how does it stack up at the moment? Well, uh, I think that uh, Turkey played a signif significantly bigger role in, in a recent, recent years. That's one point. And their role was uh, self-evidently positive. Uh, especially Minister Davutoglu, Ahmed Davutoglu had, was very energetic about it. You know that he created two troikas. Uh, when he did it, I mean, everyone was to a certain extent surprised. But he created troika, Serbia, Turkey, and Bosnia and Herzegovina troika, and Turkey, Bosnia, and Croatia troika. Uh, I think uh, that some very concrete things were done under moderation of, 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 of Turkey. Uh, not under supervision, but on, as the moderators. They did, you remember that they did a good job when uh, when Serbian parliament adopted the resolution on Srebrenica. You know that there was big dispute, there was very big internal issue in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and there was big regional issue about, and there was big internal issue in Serbia about Serbian parliament, parliament adopting a resolution about Srebrenica. So in that respect, I think, at that very crucial moment, in, that, in, in, in a moment in which the things could go in very, very wrong direction. You can say now, well, they didn't much. They didn't do much. Yes, but if they didn't do that, what was counted as no much, I mean, what would be the, the overall, overall uh, atmosphere in the region? So I think that they did a good thing. Uh, of course, uh, to, when, 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 you know, there, there's always stereotypes and prejudices in Balkan. 
I mean, uh, I don't know, in a similar situation, someone asked me, how come that so many high reps were Austrians? I said, why? Well, because of Austro-Hungarian Empire, I wasn't thinking about it. Uh, we didn't have a Turkish high rep. By the way, he could have been because he's a member of Peace Implementation Council as a country. But I mean, uh, if that would happen, hypothetically speaking, probably you'd say, oh, Turks. Why? What is the problem as far as it, it is functioning? But since the prejudices, stereotypes, okay, fine. So, you see, every question, it's very interesting, interesting your question. I mean, because when I was asking, even in, in, a, in a very private discussions. I was very much interested, okay, I got it, but what is the problem? Find me the place where they created a problem. Find me the situation in which it created a problem. No one has a problem. Everyone has some subconscious. I'm a doctor. I have a PhD, but in computer science. I'm not Freudian. I mean, I don't know how does it work, but uh, I see that the, there is no nothing concretely but the positive positive things. Uh, Davutoglu did a lot of positive things when putting down together some, some tensions in between two entities going to Banja Luka to sort out some problems. Did he, did he have to do it? No. Would it be, would it be questionably, questionable if he failed? Yes, it would. But he went over there and he did it. So my answer to that uh, is, uh, to your question is, clearly and simply, Turkish role is a positive one, and everyone who has a role that is not patronizing anyone over there, it's a positive one. I saw a few hands towards the middle. Yes, you, sir. Um. Hi. My name is uh, Vedran Kulc. I'm Bosnian from the group of the others, so I'm just a concerned individual. I have a question about the foreign affairs rather than internal uh, matters. Uh, so how do you uh, tend to approach uh, the region, Croatia and Serbia, since there Bosnia is uh, uh, one of the biggest trade partners and uh, obviously integration of, of the region in uh, economical and, and political sense is, is key to um, negotiating EU. So wh what is your stand about it? What are you going to do? Because it seems to me that uh, uh, for the last 20 years, in the, in the last few years, there's a, a willingness, political willingness to cooperate and, and discuss from government, governments of, of Serbia and Croatia. And, uh, but, but still, their relationship to Bosnia is better than the relation between themselves, I mean Serbia and Croatia. Now, how can Bosnia sort of exploit that in terms of mediating uh, uh, relations between them uh, to, 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 her, to Bosnia's advantage, basically? Well, I think that uh, in the last two years since uh, President Josipović uh, took office in, in Zagreb, we are all witnessing a very uh, positive dynamics on a presidential level. Uh, President Josipović initiated uh, meetings with President Tadic, then later on with the presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina, then they started with Troika without Turks, then they had the Troikas with Turks, uh, but then there were Troika in between Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia on a presidential level. Uh, and um, that, uh, that was really the news for a few, few times. But then uh, in the end we all realized that uh, after, after that presidential positive energy, there is no concrete uh, work on a, on a government's and ministerial's level and lower levels. Uh, when I went to Belgrade a few days ago, um, I found out, I mean, in, in, my, in my notes, that the last meeting of so-called uh, Serbia-Bosnia uh, Intergovernmental Council, which was actually intended 10 years ago, uh, that mini on a ministerial level and technical level, uh, we are sorting out issues like property issues, uh, diplomas, uh, accreditations of different institutions, and so on and so on. Very concrete things. The last date of having uh, intergovernmental council between Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina was in 2005. So, I mean, sometimes we don't, that positive energy that was created on the top, it becomes created on the top, but then we don't follow. So in that respect, I think that first we have to do very concrete, concrete things. I'll give you another example with, with Croatia. Uh, uh, 
we already were Prime Minister Milanovic was in Sarajevo. Uh, we already had uh, spoke about about it, and we already agreed that two respective ministers have to make some action plan about sorting out the issue that is pending for more than 15 years in between Croatia and Serbia, which is a Bosnian exit to the uh, uh, port Ploče and Croatian passage over Neum to Dubrovnik area. You know that previous Croatian government they had some the election campaign program about bridge getting over, over Pelješac and this government is, gave up that bridge, I mean, because of economic reasons and because of communication reasons. But they are interested, logically, that Dubrovnik gets connected on Adriatic Ionic uh, Highway through, through, through parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina because we both think that we will meet in the EU. So what is the problem? Uh, and now we are in the process of putting together the, our expert teams who would sort out the issue of common approach of Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, even in Brussels, to look uh, uh, for some, some, some support for such a project, which is regional interstate communication. Uh, but but uh, when uh, I went to, 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 to Belgrade a few days ago, I was asked why your first visit to neighbors is in Belgrade. I said because of two reasons. First reason is why an, uh, first reason is, I mean, first visit has to be with your neighbors. Because in Bosnia, you know, we are all saying no one is as close to you as your neighbor. Even your brother is further away from you than your neighbor. So, I mean, first we have to go to talk with neighbors. Why Serbia? Well, because that's the neighbor I have the biggest problems with, in technical sense. Why my first visit was not in Montenegro? I said to the Montenegro ambassador, I have a big problem with you. The biggest problem I have around is you. He said, why us? Well, because I have no problems with you. Uh, I mean, uh, because we have no problems with Montenegro. So this, is, this became normal. And then we don't, I mean, we don't do business. Now, uh, uh, what I think is, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was going to, in Belgrade, I spoke with, foreign, with a few of key ministers in state government. And, one of the ministers I spoke, I, I asked them, I mean, to give me a few key points because we're a new government. I'm going to Belgrade, what are, the, what are the things that you think? Give me three key points besides the papers that was prepared for me from your ministry. And I spoke with foreign trade minister, Mr. Mirko Šarović, who you know very well used to be president of SDS. So SDS is ne definitely not the role model of my partner. But I mean, he's my partner in this coalition. He's Minister of Foreign Trade. So I asked him, I mean, is there anything I can, Mirko, that you, I should address tomorrow? He said, well, excellent. For two years, we have the agreement between Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina about mutual recognition of accreditation institutions for trade. And he said, for two years, I have no, my ministry has no response. Serb minister was before him, and he served. But they had no response from Belgrade. Uh, so tomorrow when I was in a meeting with President Tadic, I told him first thing that I spoke with Mirko, I want that. And he looked at me, he said, are you serious? I said, of course I'm serious. I mean, do you know? It, in the end it came out that it was stuck someplace in, in bureaucracy. But you see, I said, see how bizarre it is. I'm coming as a foreign minister, who is definitely not Serb, to Belgrade, to sort out issue in between Bosnia and Serbia that was stuck on a bureaucratic level, and two Serbs were on both sides negotiating with it. So we have to get rid of those prejudices. We have to go to get rid of those things. My dear friend Mirko told me, well, Zlatko, I mean, we have, you know, as, as a Bosnian, you have that old saying. He said, well, Zlatko, maybe, because he's really trying, he's, he's trying to protect interests of Bosnia and Herzegovina. But there's always prejudice that Serbs from Bosnia will have some double deal with their, no. He, he was interested in having a deal in interests of Bosnia, and it was interests of Serbia as well. He said, Maybe Zlatko, we are brothers, but our cash registers are not sisters. <laughs> so we have to sort it out. I said, I like the way you think. See, we're improving every day. So the bottom line is, Mirko, I mean, with all the respect, I'm not asking you to be as big Bosnian as I am, but I hope you agree that we should both stop being stupid Bosnians when we get out of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Because we should stop being treated by our neighbors as someone, regardless of ethnicity and religion, that we look like stupid Bosnians. And when we, when we use the most advanced, the oldest methodology that humankind 
used in sorting out the problems, which is called simple common sense. We will, we will get just like this in NATO and EU and all those things. But common sense didn't live so much in our area for a few decades. With all the respect, I mean, it's not about international treaties, it's not about human rights, it's about common sense. And we should go back to that, that logic. Minister, on the, um, on the note of the rebirth of common sense, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint a, f a few people who are not, I'm not going to be able to call on. Um, just to conclude, I'd like to ask everyone in the audience um, to make two requests. First of all, please uh, remain seated until the foreign minister and his delegation um, leave because they're leaving for the airport and have a rather tight schedule. But before they leave, I hope you will uh, join me in thanking the foreign minister for his remarks. Thank you.